Okay, Guy Needler from England. Well, thank you for being here and uh, being within the audience for this presentation. Actually, Beyond the Source Book 1 and Book 2 I presented last year, and I thought this year I would do something just slightly different. Because during 2012, I was getting a lot of information from the source about the ascension process, and that resulted in two articles which I submitted to various spiritual magazines in the UK. Because the content was in variance to that which was being presented in two, for the 21st to the 12th, 2012, they were actually rejected. Post 21st of the 12th, they've been accepted. So this shows that actually there's now a recognition of the work that I pres was presenting actually had uh, a lot of reality in it as against projection of information. So what I'm going to do today is really understand the ascension process. I'm going to explain a bit about what happened on the 21st to the 12th. That what dates are are really milestones and how they work with us. And then I'm going to go, the, go through the ascension process, that it's gradual and that there's a, there's a tiered approach to it and how we are, are affected by it. And then I'm going to just illustrate some levels of proof that we are ascending because we ascend in a gradual way. It's not quite apparent that we are actually ascending and we expect certain things to happen in a, in a very dramatic sort of way. And then I'm going to finish off by giving you some information that's going to happen in the far future, what our ultimate destiny is as incarnate individuals and how we're working with our source entity. So, how many of you are disappointed that we're still here? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's an awful lot of people out there who thought we were going to go straight up in the air and become a, a, of a different frequency, and that we were going to be experiencing different functionality like teleportation and telekinesis and telepathy and all those sorts of things. But we're finding that actually the Earth is no different than it was the day before. And that's led, left us with a lot of confusion in terms of what's happening out there. So what I'm going to do today is try to lift the confusion from you to help you understand what that ascension process is and give you some confidence that actually we are ascending and we have a significant role to play with the planet, ourselves, and actually with the universe that we work within. I'm going to repeat these words a lot because ascension is a slow, gradual, robust and repeatable process. The large changes that we expect cannot and will not happen. It's unsustainable. If we look back at history of some of the things that have happened with other civilizations, such as Atlantis, where they've been exposed to higher frequency existence and it's corrupted them, we can see that we're, not, we're trying not to make those same mistakes again. And that's something that the source, our God, is also helping us move forwards with. Now, when we talk about milestones or, or ascension and what's happened in the past, we, we've had a big focus on the 21st to the 12th, 2012, and we expected lots of changes to happen frequently and in terms of how we inter interface with each other. But what a lot of people don't know is where we were supposed to be frequently and therefore within our own evolution and ascension, we, we actually made it in February last year but nobody noticed, or nobody really understood what had happened. And but if you look at it in a, from a backdoor perspective, we look and we stand back and we say, OK, what, what did happen? We start to notice that things are happening around us, and there are people who were previously not spiritual, who, who, or who wouldn't have had any work with it at all, but they're starting to become interested. And those are the little signs that we look for, to say, actually, we are, in fact, ascending. So one of the things we need to understand is that dates are only estimated milestones in what's happening around us. And they tend to be used by spiritual people who take them from the, the entities or the people that they're working with, the energetic entities, whether they're angels, whether they're guides, whether they're shamanic information, 
but they end up being misinterpreted. We, rather than waiting and getting clarification for that information, we move straight on and go into publication. And, <laughs> and as a result of that, people grab hold of that information and run with it. And, and before we know it, it becomes mainstream information. There's a lot of individuals who I know who put a lot of money, if they were betting people, on the ascension of the 21st and the 12th. And it completely ruined their outlook of spiritual life. What's more, all of those individuals out there who belittle spiritual work, who don't believe in the energetic, that they, they think that we are just the human vehicle, are taking great stock from this and pride and pointing fingers and saying, oh, you, know, you are talking a load of rubbish and this is just nonsense and these dates being missed are proof of that. But in essence, that isn't the case. Things are happening in a more slow way. Now, when we talk about ascension and when we look at ascension and the dates that we have, we expect a, what I call a cliff face ascension. We move along on a path and we think at this point in time, we're going to achieve this level of ascension. This is a cliff face ascension. But the problem with the cliff face ascension is we can have a descension as well, just as easily. So, and if we have a cliff face ascension where we experience all of the new things, the new functions that we have energetically and spiritually at these different uh, levels of, um, of, of, of frequential height and energetic uh, experience, when we lose them, we're going to be upset. <laughs> it's, it's going to, up, you know, it's going to really la make us lose our confidence in where we are. So we need to understand what's happening. Believe it or not, I think that spiritual people are actually quite flat earthers. We look at where we are and we say, okay, when we travel down this road and we reach a certain point in time, we're going to get to a certain level of ascension or we're going to ascend straight away. It's a quite a large way to go. And actually, this requires a critical mass. Now, ascension is an individual thing. So when we get to a certain point, we need a critical mass to get there. But that's a large jump in frequency, and it requires everything to be perfect in every way. The problem with a critical mass is that critical mass needs to be maintained, otherwise we descend. And we only need one individual to drop out of that critical mass, and we come tumbling down the frequencies. I'll give you an example of this. How many times have we heard of mountaineers being on the side of a cliff face somewhere, and one of them has lost their grip and then they've pulled all of the other mountaineers down with them who are linked with them. Yeah? That's an example of what happens when we lose our critical mass. Not one person drops down out of, out of high frequency existence, but the whole critical mass drops down out of high frequency existence. And that's because we're relying on the, the function of critical mass rather than of individual ascension and some of the more complicated ways in which individuals work together to create a more sustainable and robust group ascension rather than critical mass-based ascension. So what's actually happening? Well, as we move through time, we don't go on a flat road. We gradually walk up a, an incline. And this incline moves further and further upwards and we get closer and closer to those levels of frequency that we wanted to go to. So in this example here, we can see that although we're walking and we don't experience big changes in frequency, we're actually being exposed to them as we, as we go. We get normalised to them. Does anybody ever hear of boat lag? No? <laughs> no? We've got jet lag. Yeah? We've got jet lag, but nobody's ever had boat lag. <laughs> And the reason why we don't have boat lag is when we go from New York to Southampton you know, in the old transatlantic boats, we go across the time zones slowly. So we get normalised to those time zones and we come the other side, we arrive and we're fresh. When we go on an aeroplane and we travel from, from New York or Newark to, to London and it takes us seven hours, we've travelled those five time zones within that seven hours and we're not used to the new time zone. So we end up being very tired or, or, or fatigued and, and, and distressed sometimes. And that's the jet lag. 
That's because it's happened too quickly. And this is what happens with this, uh, this mass ascension, where we all happen at the same time, but it's based upon a critical mass. So ascension is really a gradual process. It's happening all of the time. It's happening to everybody all of the time. It's not a case of, when we get here, we're going to be up there. It's a case of, well, actually, we're moving along at a slow pace and everything is happening consistently. We're getting exposed to higher frequencies on a regular basis. It's happening all the time. So really, we should not be too concerned about what's happening from an ascension perspective. We shouldn't be wondering what it should be, but more in, in, in being in tune with what we want it to be, because ascension is, is personal. It's something that happens to us as an individual rather than as, as a group, although it, there is a group function as well. So we have to commit ourselves to assisting in this acceleration and remove the need for low frequency incarnate experiential experience. And that me means that we have a, a, you know, a gradual, repeatable and robust ascension personally and how we affect others as well. So a gradual ascension enables us to recognise those changes. So if we stand back and look at ourselves and say, okay, last year I was this person, now I'm another person. And that means that what's happening to us has been gradual, so gradual we haven't noticed it. But if we take snapshots in time and we look at these changes that have happened with us, we can see that, well, this time last year I wasn't interested in things that were spiritual, but now I am. People who weren't becoming aware and awake are becoming aware and awake. So these things are very subtle, they're happening slowly. And this allows us to develop in a, a non-egotistical way, making us work or ha helping us to work for the benefit of others rather than just for ourselves. Working for others, being of service, being a healer is one of the first steps to assuring our own personal ascension. So in terms of what happens next to us, well it's up to us basically, it's how we work with things, what, how, we, how we affect them, how they affect us, how we work with ourselves. And it's important that we do work with ourselves and, and everybody here is working individually and together. As a group you're working together and the frequency within this hall and actually within the whole area has been, has ri has been r risen a lot, significantly over the last two or three days. And this is happening in pockets all over the world right now. But personally, you're working on your own ascension. And it's how you work with yourself that counts. Now, thinking about this, our behaviour patterns show us how we're ascending. So if we were previously quite selfish and materialistic and now we're no longer materialistic and we're willing to help others, that means we're, uh, we're working in a higher frequency condition. And those energies work in tandem with something called triangulation. Do you all understand what triangulation is? No. Well, triangulation, for those of you who don't know, is really is elevation through association. A little bit like the hundredth monkey principle, if you understand that. For instance, if Dolores is a higher frequency than me, and she's up there frequently, and I'm, I am here, my, my association with her will mean that my own frequency is pulled up towards hers because of the association with her. Being in her presence helps me, on a subliminal basis, pull up my own frequencies and become a, a, a higher frequency. People in between us that we know individually that may not know us ourselves, but we might know somebody who knows an intermediary person, help also in, in, in ascension. And this is called direct line triangulation, where we, we, we affect those in between us by knowing friends and relatives. There's something else as well called uh, group triangulation, where we have pockets of people who are ascending and going up the frequencies, and they affect the individuals in between them. And if there's more than two groups, they affect the individuals within the area of that. So that's, that's called inflational triangulation. So we affect each other. When we ascend ourselves, 
we affect each other. And this results in an increase in evolutionary content that affects individuals and the masses alike. But that's, that's up to us as to how we work with that. Okay, we're ascending, you say. It's gradual, it's repeatable. But where's the proof? <laughs> well, there's lots of proof around us. All we need to do is to really sort of open our eyes and look and see what's happening. There's been a, a rise in, in the number of individuals who are interested in things of spirit. If you look around you and see friends at work or colleagues at work, colleagues in, 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 the, in the golf club, for instance, or people that you normally associate with, just look at them and see, well, who of those who are, haven't been interested in things of the spirit, or things that are energetic and metaphysics, who's suddenly become interested? Who's bought a book that you wouldn't have expected them to buy? Who's going to a workshop that you wouldn't have expected to attend? And these little things that show us that, you know, there is an increase in frequency, and these individuals are being affected by them, and they're rising up through the frequencies as well as a result of that. Some individuals, and I've had some of my, my own uh, students and clients experience this, have started to perceive entities who operate in the frequencies above the visual range of the human eye. So they've started to see what we call aliens or other incarnate entities of higher frequency. They catch them out of their corner of their eye, or they see them head on, uh, either in their bedroom at night sometimes, or see them in the, in the road. And they see some of their craft as well, some of the constructs that they've used to, to bridge the gap, to come into our lower frequency existence. So, uh, the, and some of these things are quite worrying for people because they, they're starting to experience something that they've not experienced before, that's outside of their paradigm. But nevertheless, they have been affected by the frequencies of others and they've risen as a case of that and they've ascended in the process to a certain level. Those who are already spiritually inclined will start to become more intuitive. They'll get additional and more in-depth functions that are associated with higher frequency existence. Some individuals might start to become more aware and awake of the greater reality, of, of the worlds of spirit. They'll start to become more clairaudient, more clairvoyant, more clairsentient they'll start to realise that they have a, a world purpose rather than a, just an individualised purpose that <laughs> you know, is more akin as to, where, as to where they're supposed to be. And these individuals, you'll start to see, will become frustrated or unhappy with their roles in their existing jobs and careers and they'll want to move away and do something which is more in keeping with where they're supposed to be going next, their, their roles in, in, in the spirit world. But more importantly, more physical proof can be seen to the rapid rise in new technology. And this is one of the big pointers that we have. Our new technology is being given to us from spirit. As, as human beings, we don't have the capacity for the level of invention we have. But this is happening on a regular basis. So, people we call inventors, okay, semi-aware individuals who are not, not aware that they are in, in, in connectivity with the spirit world, with, with the energetic, but are nevertheless getting downloads. They're giving, being given information which they, which they personally resolve as being gut feelings or intuition or, or getting a, a break, as it were, are being given information from the cosmos, from, from the source, from other entities, on technological breaks to give them quantum leaps to allow us to move forwards. And if you think about it, look at how fast we've moved with technology, certainly with displays. Look at the big televisions we've got now. We're talking about 100 inch televisions. Huge things, yeah. High definition televisions that, that work on the internet that you can record three or four programs on at the same time that are five millimeters thick that's it's amazing, isn't it? Look at the smartphones we've got now. Some of this technology, if you look at some of this technology, it's far in excess of what was predicted on Star Trek. If you think about it, the, the only thing Star Trek's got that we haven't got is teleportation and interplanetary travel. Or have we? <laughs> we, just, we just don't know. We don't know what's being kept from us. But all of these things are evidence 
that we are moving higher up the frequencies, that we're ascending and that we're gaining additional information as a result of that, whether it's through technological breaks, whether it's through personal ascension and association with entities and other incarnate entities that are around the physical universe and including those entities that are beyond the physical universe in the other parts of the multiverse that was created by our source entity, our God, to allow us to evolve and move forwards. There's another piece of proof that we are ascending, and that is that you find the people around us start to disappear. How many of you have been in a shop, you've bought your, your new blouse or your jacket or your pants, and you've gone to the desk where the, the, the person there who's serving you has looked completely through you, and then somebody else has come behind you and they've been served first. Have you had that? Yes? Yeah. And it happens on a regular basis. And then the next person will come along and be served before you. And you're thinking, hang about. What's going on here? Are they just ignorant? Or, they <laughs> or have I done something wrong? And then you start to get frustrated and angry and annoyed. And all of a sudden, they say, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't see you there. Do you have you experienced that? They actually say those words, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Let me change those words, I'm sorry, I didn't perceive you. <laughs> they use their third eye in a pretty unaware state, and that augments the vision from their, their visual eyes. If their third eye is not in tune with your frequency, they're not going to see you, because the physical eyes have only got a very limited bandwidth to work with. So they just don't see you. So you disappear from their vision. <laughs> The only way you work with them is by lowering your frequency. Okay? And we lower our frequency by thinking low frequency thoughts. We get angry. This person is he's, he's deliberately ignoring me. <laughs> I'm going to put one on them if I'm not careful. So, and that's the only way you bring yourself down. How many of you have had experience of people cutting you up on the road? You've been driving your car and they've not seen you at all, and they pull straight into your lane. Yeah, it happens when you're driving your car as well. So you have to be careful when you're driving your car, to, just to remember that these people don't see you at all. You're a higher frequency, and you lift the frequency of your vehicle, your car as well, so you become invisible. <laughs> so it's important to make sure that, really, we know how to remain higher frequency by thinking good thoughts, loving thoughts, understanding the failures of those around us and, and just, just understanding them for their own, you know, what they are, they're working in their own evolutionary path and, and respecting that and maintaining our high frequency, but actually realising that we have to drop down once in a while to work with the rest of the world <laughs> because otherwise we can't get our shopping, <laughs> we can't get our groceries. <laughs> so it's important to, to think of it in those terms. When you're ascending, when you're here, you're full of high frequency people. They see you, they work with you, they can, you, know, you, can, you can interface with each other. But when you go out there, it's pretty low frequency. And if you're not careful, people will run you over <laughs> or, 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 or cut you up in your car or forget to sell you a product that you want to buy from JC, Pennies or Macy's. <laughs> now ascension has a process associated with it and it's a three tier process. Okay. The progression of a process leading up to the first tier is what's happening right now. So those of us who are ascending the frequencies will start to leave those behind frequentially. We become invisible to them. And that includes those people who are able to be affected by triangulation. They're on the cusp of moving up. They're associated with somebody who is of a high frequency and therefore they get pulled up as well. So they come along as well. But there's an awful lot of individuals, like most of the Earth actually, that will stay where they are. But the problem is, they also will need to ascend in their own time, and they will also be affected by triangulation. But if there's all these individuals moving up the frequencies, and there's those that are down there, what happens? Do we suddenly start to 
lose people and these people around us start to realise that actually there's people disappearing around us. It's going to cause a little bit of confusion. So what happens is we have a critical mass to maintain and what's happening is there's, there's been an agreement that energetic entities of a, a different quality, shall I say, of being allowed to incarnate in human bodies and experience individualised free will. Now you'll, you'll be able to spot these individuals because they're, they're the way they behave, they're aggressive, they, they're materialistic, they think only of themselves, they are, they're the sort of individuals that you know aren't highly evolved. But they're here for a reason. They're here to maintain the critical mass of lower frequencies. So those individuals who are catching up with their ascension process, those people who are left behind at the moment, will also get chance to ascend in their own way, in their own right, because the critical mass is being maintained. Now these individuals are being called backfill people. The, the source told me these are backfill people because as people move up the frequencies, you need to backfill to maintain the critical mass so that the rest of mankind can also ascend. So they're called backfill people. And it's, <laughs> it's a, they're doing a role, they're doing a job, and they're benefiting from this. So they're also evolving and ascending as a, as a product of this. Now when all of mankind ascends and has gone up to this different level, the work of these backfill people will be completed and they will return back to their normal energetic environment and they, can, they will pass on all of their experiences, all of their learning and all of their evolutionary content to their own energetic race which will elevate them as well. So they will also benefit from helping us ascend, accelerating our process to ascension by helping to maintain this critical mass so that those who are Struggle, struggling a little bit or a little bit slow in their ascension process are also able to catch us up. So this progression towards tier one leads up to tier one ascension. And tier one ascension is when all of incarnate mankind becomes aligned with the higher frequencies of the physical universe. And those of you who read my books, The History of God and the Beyond the Source book, book one and later when it arrived, book two, you'll notice that the top frequency within the physical universe is, the, is level 12, frequency level 12. So when we all get to that point where we're all working on the 12th frequency, we will, have, we will have achieved this tier one ascension, this tier one progression. It's allowing us to move onwards and upwards faster. Now what happens then is interesting because the rest of the physical universe, all those other incarnate entities that are out there that don't have individualised free will will be able to benefit from our success. They will also be given the opportunity to have individualised free will, which will allow them to accelerate their own evolutionary process, their own ascension, because it will be recognised that personalised and individualised free will is an accelerant. It allows us to move upwards faster. And when the whole universe is of the correct frequency, the whole environmental structure will move into the next full frequency. And that gives us second tier ascension. So second tier ascension is progression of the whole universe into the next two frequencies associated with the next full dimension. So the whole universe will be relocated initially into the first frequency band, the 13th frequency band in, in my books and what I teach in the Traversing the Frequencies workshops and th they are fine enough to house a complete and individual universe in their own right. So the 13th frequency holds a universe in its own right and so does the 14th universe. And so we'll progress from the physical universe up to the next universe in the next dimension and then as we move upwards, things happen faster. Because the frequencies are higher and things are finer, we move faster. We're able to achieve things faster. So our movements from 13 to 14 will be much faster than it has been to go from where we are now to the 12th frequency, the top end of the physical universe. So we'll be moving much faster. This will lead to tier three, where all 
incarnate vehicles will eventually evolve to the point of not being physical, which means that the 14th level is the last level where a physical vehicle, a, human, a body of some sort, is necessary to allow us to experience these frequencies. Now, by physical, I don't mean like this body now. Physical is a term based upon certain frequency levels. And although it's physical, it would be like the finest gas you've ever experienced. You won't be able to see it, you won't be able to perceive it, but it's nevertheless physical. So when we move into the third tier of ascension, we move into the 15th frequency level. But the 15th is too fine to support physicality. So third tier ascension removes the need for us to incarnate, to evolve. And that's where we're heading, basically. That's where we're going to. We're moving beyond the need to incarnate, to evolve. And in that instance, everything is done energetically. And that brings me into another piece of ascension process that will happen in the far future, quite a long way away from where we are right now. For those of you who've read the, the history of God and, and beyond the source, you will know that the 12 source entities were created by the origin to accelerate its own evolutionary progression. And our source entity, what we call God, was one of those and created us in response to that. We were created to experience the very minute detail of the structure that the source entity created to allow us to experience, learn and evolve and pass that evolutionary content back to our source. But when eventually all of the creations, such as ourselves with our own source entity, return to their source, they finish their evolutionary cycle and become one with their source, they're one with their God again, the origin, the creator of the source entities, will be ready to move into its next area of self-awareness. Because the origin is a huge, vast tract of energy and space and everythingness. But it only knows a minute fraction of what it is. And in moving forwards with its own ex evolutionary process, it needs to move into its another area of, of awareness. So when we've all finished our evolutionary cycle, this allows the origin to move onwards as well. And we benefit from this because in this vast new expanse of awareness, of self-awareness, that the origin will be moving into, we ourselves, as individualised units of our, of our source entities, will be promoted, if you like. We will become source entities in our own right, assisting the origin in its quest to experience, learn and evolve within its, its new and massively expanded area of self-awareness. And that's where we're going to, that's where we're heading to. So think of what we're doing now and how we're moving forwards in our own individual basis and, and how we're going to move forwards with the, the universe, we're affecting the universe. What we do here is affecting how other entities are going to work and evolve and ascend in their own right. And then we're going to move the whole universe up to the next level. And then eventually as we work with it and continue to ascend up, up the frequencies, we will become source entities, gods. Not just individualised units of gods, parts of gods, but gods in our own right. Thank you. Now, all of this information is, was given to me in meditations from our source entity and the origin over the first three months of 2012 last year. So if there's anything that's there that you want to ask questions on, then please do. Well, you know, Guy, why don't you tell them how you got into this in the first place? Okay. From an engineer to this. <laughs> well, in, in, the, in, my, uh, in my youth, my, my pre-teenage years, I was always interested in things of spirit. And I started to perceive things that were happening around me. I could see nature spirits, I could see the wind, I could hear and, and perceive and experience things from astral travelling perspective. And I started to do lots and lots of meditation on my own. And I bought lots of books, some of the, you know, the, the groundbreaking books of the time. And I really, as, as, a, as a young teenager, got very engrossed in things of spirit. And then, one morning in a meditation, I had a vi visualisation 
where I, was see I saw th four robed individuals, white robed individuals in front of me. And they didn't speak to me, but they communicated in a way which I fully understood without the need for the spoken word. And they told me that what I was working with as a young person, what I was reading, what I was experimenting with, what I was meditating on, was, was right. What I was experiencing was right. What I was researching was right. But it wasn't the right time for me to do it. I need to get more earthly lessons. I need to get more background, some more information. So from that point onwards, I actually put the spiritual stuff on the back burner. I, was, I still read the odd book and I still read science fiction and those sorts of things, but I never really had the same level of dedicated devotion and you know, desire that I had in those, those early years. And during the next 20 years, I did what everybody else did. I went to work, I strove to get promoted, I became uh, a senior manager within the company I was working for. I gained two master's degrees, became a, a chartered engineer, met my beautiful wife and we, we got married. And we bought a house, <laughs> a mortgage, <laughs> had to sustain that. And, you know, and we did what everybody else did in the material world. And then one of the ladies who I was on, a, on a, a management course with, in fact, it's the lady who's helping me right now as my manager, said, I'm going to a Reiki share night. Do you want to come? And I thought, mm, OK, I'll go. So I went to this Reiki share night and was hooked. Twelve months later, I graduated as a Reiki master. <laughs> Pretty quick. <laughs> and then I was going to uh, an energy healer because one of my degrees I was doing at the time was very stressful and I was struggling big time and my confidence was, was going down and I was, I, was, I was having a hard time of it. And she said, well, you know, I can work with you energetically and I can give you some homeopathics for it. But think about this. I'm going to do a workshop that's based upon the work that Barbara Brennan taught me. In fact, it's going to be identical. Do you want to come along? So I said, OK, I'll go along. I signed up to a four-year commitment after that weekend that was uh, financially stressful, and <laughs> as a workload, it was equally stressful as a, as a master's degree. But what I noticed was, was that it became easy and simple to do things. And I was, I was interested in what was happening there because it was a, a next step onwards from the Reiki. Now, another friend of mine who was in the automotive industry, he moved to Sweden to work for a car company called Saab. And he also worked, did some Reiki work. And his Reiki master said to him, you've got to get Guy over to, to see you because something's going to happen over there. You need to take him somewhere. So my friend, Graham, said to me, do you want to come over and visit me? You can have a, free, you know, a cheap holiday and we can stop at my house. And there's a, a, in those days, there was an airline company that was doing, doing budget flights, really cheap budget flights, like 19 pounds return to Sweden from, <laughs> from Birmingham. Outstanding. So we went on this budget flight. And, and the next day, Graham took me on a walk, which took me down through some woods onto a pathway that was parallel to a river. And as we walked down this, down this pathway, I noticed that my hands were tingling, and then my arms were tingling, and then my whole body was tingling. And I said, Graham, the energies here are fantastic. And he says, yes, it is full of energy, isn't it, in, in nature? <laughs> and we walked along this, this pathway, and there was a little rock, like a little island on this river. And I, I said, I need to sit down and meditate on this rock, which I did. And, and my wife, Anna and Graham, went onto a, a bridge that spanned the one side to the other side, a suspension bridge, and they sat and waited. On this rock, I sat and meditated, and I received the most profound attunement I've ever experienced in my whole life. It was 25 minutes long, and it, it left me speechless for two or three days. It was like being continually drunk and not being able to string three words together, let alone a sentence. But it was amazing, because my wife was also uh, an intuitive person. She said, I could feel entities or craft coming through a portal and working with you. They were rewiring you. Well, when my attunement finished, I started to look around me. And I noticed that I was already starting to perceive things. 
and I saw what were what appeared to be craft across the way that were hidden by some sort of shielding or something, some, something that I could only see the outline along the background, backdrop of these trees. And the other thing that was interesting was that there was no wind. And the river, in the local area of where these trees were that I was perceiving what I thought was craft, there was lots of waves, really choppy waves, just like the downwash from a helicopter. But nothing else. It's just very localised. There was no wind anywhere. It was a dead calm day. So there was obviously something going on there. And then I received a very large com loud command. And it said, don't overstrain what we've just done to you. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Give it a chance to settle down, which I did. Anyway, I went back to the UK. I went on with my energy healing. But I found that during some of the workshops we had to do, we had to work with chakras and move up the frequency levels to, to, to affect healing on chakras and the different auric layers. But I found out that I could go much higher than those levels. I was going beyond the seven frequency levels or energy levels associated with the auric layers and the chakras and going beyond. And my, my, my teacher, my instructor, noticed I was going further than I should be and she, um, she reprimanded me quite severely on a number of occasions, uh, publicly. So, so I learned very quickly to stay where I was. But what happened was, was I practiced outside of that environment and I'd started to develop techniques that allowed me to go higher and higher and higher. And whilst I was doing these techniques, I noticed, started to notice that over a certain level, I was able to contact different entities. And one of those entities initially presented itself like a dragon to scare me off. And it said, I shouldn't be there. You know, incarnate mankind doesn't come this high. Get down, you shouldn't be here. And it tried to scare me off by searching through my mind to see what was supposedly frightening to me. But it didn't put me off and I kept on going. And eventually it started to talk to me properly and it gave me a name and it changed its form factor to something that was more in keeping with what I would be used to. And I gained lots of information. And, the, and I then started to realise I could go higher and higher and higher. And eventually I, I became in contact with another group of entities called the OM, who are entities that were created by the, as a result of some of the Origins work in, in, its, in its earlier existence. And they gave me a guide to work with, which I was with for only a few months because I very quickly outgrew his, the need for it to be there. And over the months and the years, I started to get in contact with a higher entity, which later announced itself as, as the source entity, our God. And much later, the origin announced itself to me as being the creator of the source entity and of the source entities. And every morning before I went to work, I used to go out into the back garden, which is a reasonably large back garden with lots of trees. I used to stand there in meditation and log into these areas and bring information back. And it's the information that came from these meditations that I started to, to journalise and write down. And those meditations eventually became the history of God, which after three or four years was large enough to be able to be submitted as a book and I submitted it to a number of different publishers one of them was Dolores and Ozark and that's where the history of God came from and subsequent meditations and work have resulted in the Beyond the Source books as well and that brings us up to date I think <laughs> okay Shows how you evolved from an engineer into this weird world. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any questions? We've got about five minutes. Anybody wants to ask mm. a question? Please. Can we come to the microphone, please? But well, uh, get it over to them because we don't have time for them right. to come up. You can run pretty fast. I'm just wait for him. Okay, because because uh, Gabe, there's not enough time for them. <clears throat> How do we know where we're ascended to at this point, individually or in mass? Um, are some of us further along than others? We are all individually, individually ascending. Um, some of the readings I do, I give people an understanding of where their true energetic self is. 
in terms of the, 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 their location within the multiverse. But it's not really important to know where you are right now. It's more important to get on with what you're doing and, and do higher frequency work. If we start to think about where we are, we'll get distracted by that and we'll start to miss the work that we're supposed to be doing and not really focus on, on, on the work that's here that, we've, that we're here to achieve. I, in reality, we are all in a certain level and we're all around about the first quarter of the frequencies associated with the, the multiverse that the, our source entity created. That's where most people are right now. The process that you presented is entirely fascinating and, and I don't doubt any of it. Can we do this in this particular lifetime or is this a process that we have to continue to incarnate in order to proceed with? This, the whole process is a long way away. We can work on ourselves in this particular lifetime and through diligence and working with like-minded people, keeping good company, doing good things, we will negate many lifetimes. We can remove the need to, to incarnate by doing lots of good things, helping people, being of service to people, and, and really doing everything that a, a highly evolved individual should be doing. We won't reach the ultimate in this lifetime, but what we can do is remove the number of incarnations that we would have to do now by working with ourselves and with others in the right way now. Anybody else well, over there? Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if the once we get to the level fifteen, if and and then we go on to the next process, whatever that is. If that is part of the ex, uh, contraction expansion um, idea that we hear about sometimes, I think the East Indians have a name for that, uh, which I cannot pronounce. But <laughs> Brahma something. I'm asking for higher help here. <laughs> the expansion is based upon our expansion of awareness. The contraction is what we experience when we come down the frequency and we incarnate. When we ascend, when we are ascending, when we are experiencing higher frequency existence, we expand our consciousness. We are able to get more information. It's a little bit like having a new television compared to an old television. Okay? Old televisions had, in the UK anyway, five channels to work with. New televisions now have hundreds so it's a bit like working towards moving away from the old television and going towards the new television. The new television is, has a, a much wider range of programs and channels to work with and the, the old television has a much smaller range. And it's with working now ourselves that we allow ourselves to become a higher frequency that gives us our own expansion in self-awareness. So moving up to level 15 will really make us more expansive in comparison to where we are right now. Yeah. Anybody else? Lady down here. There's one back there. Um, <coughs> I had a question. You've mentioned that, uh, you know, certain... Uh, things would speed up our evolution. And my question is, what's the rush? Why, why that? Exactly. <laughs> why not make it robust and repeatable? That's the thing. We, the thing is that the more we do, the faster we go anyway. So the higher frequency that we are, we get access to higher frequency functionality or, 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 or information or, or, or realities and therefore things get easier for us. So the higher we go, the faster we go. The higher we go, the faster we go. So when we're down here somewhere, when we have no inclination of what's going on, we, we, we really are quite slow. But it's a bit like technology. When you've invented the tools to invent the tools to invent the tools to invent the tools, you can work with things that are, that are quite high. But if you haven't invented those tools yet, you can't go anywhere. 
So acceleration in ascension is an absolute product of us working in ourselves and making sure that we do ascend and it's a robust situation. So we're going to experience acceleration anyway. It's just how long it takes us to get to that point where we do start to take off. And we are taking off right now. It's happening as we speak, as we exist, as we're here right now. It's just that we have, in the past it's happened slowly, so we've got normalised to us. We haven't got, we don't get jet lag. <laughs> yeah? There's somebody here, Vitaly, in the front. Okay. That'll be the, the last one. <laughs> I have, re I have read in Dolores' work and other work that there are many entities, many beings from other universes and other planets and all around our universe here watching this whole process. Mm -hmm. And is that because what we do here and how fast we do it and how well we do it will affect the rest of the universes. Absolutely. It'll affect our universe first. See, where we are right now, is we are the only energetic individuals that are being allowed to incarnate with individualized free will. There is no other incarnate civilization in the physical universe that is being allowed to do it. This is the big experiment. Everything, everything else is collective will, not individualized will. We have the power to choose what we do and how we experience it. Other civilizations have the, only have the power to do things in a collective sense. They have to consider the collective rather than the individual. So when this works, and it is working, we've dipped down, but we're now we're coming out the other side, we will show that individualized free will as a concept works. And therefore, when we move up to the higher frequencies of the physical universe, Everybody else will be given the chance to do the same thing, and they're all watching this with eager eyes. Okay, I think that's it's all we're going to have time for. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.